What I'd like you to do now, I gave this to you yesterday, and I believe I did tell you that I wanted you to read this Rube Goldberg Machine Challenge. If you didn't, or even if you did, I want you to reread it, because it's very important, the rules of this contest. Read those bullets, that first section right here. Read it to yourself right now, and then we're going to talk about it. All right, let's talk about this. I just ask you to read those uh, top bullets here about the contest. So I'm going to give you kind of an overview of where we're going to go with this and all the little pieces along the way. Bobby? Okay. First of all, eventually you're going to be making your own, like I did mine back there. Yours is going to be less complicated. It's going to have eight machines. And you're going to be working in teams, groups, to accomplish this. At the end, you'll have your Rube Goldberg machine, and you'll be able to explain it. You'll tell me how all the simple machines work together. You'll be able to identify them by name. You'll be able to point out the effort, the fulcrum, the resistance, all the things we talked about up there under the language goals, okay? And you're also going to turn into me an illustration, very much like the one you're going to do today, and a description. So that's what this last bullet is talking about get the illustration and the description that you're going to submit, okay? So that's the final thing. We'll be turning that in the same day that we'll be doing our contest in here. Everybody will run their machines. We'll all get to look at each other's and see which one we think is the best. There are examples of last year's winners on my webpage. I'll show you here in a little bit. The um, first bullets here, though, they explain the rules. And the reason I gave this to you now is because you're going to start by drawing out what you would like to do, your plan. And your plan is going to go on that piece of white paper that I gave you. Don't start on it yet. Wait until I explain more. And then you're going to turn that in tomorrow in class. When that's done, then you're going to get your lab assignment. The group you are allowed to be a part of will not be determined by me, but will, will be determined by each other. I'll put the top eight students at these eight stations, assuming they did a good job on their, their drawing. And you'll be the team leaders, okay? So let's say Patrick's the team leader over here at station number one. And Bethany comes up and says, I want to be a part of your team because your team is so cool. You guys rock, right? Yeah. She's going to bring up her illustration that she will have done today in class or at home and show him Look at how wonderful this is. Look at all these things I've got. Patrick's going to be like, realize you don't have the required number of machines, which is what? Eight. And you realize that there aren't enough different kinds of machines. How many different ones do there have to be? Four. Okay, so you could have two inclined planes, two declined planes, 
two uh, first class levers, okay, and uh, two wedges. That would count as four different machines. And that would give you a total of eight. You see what I'm saying? They could all be different. In fact, every kind of plane, every kind of lever is a different kind of machine. But at least four of them must be different. And I'll talk more about the rules here in a little bit. So Patrick looks at that and decides, now, you just you don't live up to the Steinle standards. Okay? So he says, no, reject it. You're not, you're not, you can't be on my team. So she now has to go shopping someplace else for a job. She shows someone else, look at my resume, look how pretty my picture is. I promise to be good. Okay? Until somebody hires her. And then she's a part of that team. Okay? Because I want you guys to work well together. You've got to like your team members. You've got to know that everyone's going to do their part. You know what tends to happen with this? All the slackers get on one team. And they're like, well, I don't know what to do. What should you do? You know, and they expect someone else to do the work. So kind of, you know, it, it's more fair that way than having the good student with the lousy student that uh, is always carrying them, is always doing the work for them. So you're going to use your illustration to get the job, to get your team. Then tomorrow, you and your team will sit down and you'll say, Patrick will say, well, I really like what you did here, and I like what you, a different person, did here. We're going to take those ideas and we're going to combine them with my ideas into one new plan. And you're going to jot down that new plan. You're going to figure out what materials you need to bring in. You'll notice I use a lot of common stuff on mine. I use PVC pipe, I use a two liter bottle, suit can, uh, paint sticks, rulers, just common things you could find around the house. And you're gonna bring in those supplies, you're gonna keep it in a box about that size above your station. And then every day you'll work on putting it into your Rube Goldberg machine and making it work. Now you read some rules there. In those rules it said the flag must be raised how high? How much time, once you've got it all worked out and you figure out how your machine's going to work and you've got all the parts, how much time will you have to get it set up to run? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. And after it runs through one time, how much time do you have to reset it? Ten minutes. Okay? So you can't waste time. And here's the hardest part about this project. It would be easier if it was like the ones you saw the kids do yesterday. You know, they built their own individual one. It's not. What makes it hard is that every period, at the end of the period, what do you have to do? Take it all off. Now, you don't take my frame. I'm going to give you a pegboard frame just like that at each station. You don't take my frame apart, but you do have to take everything off of the frame so that you start brand new the next day. Of course, if you've planned it out, you know exactly where things go. You can put it on the board in 10 minutes, then you have the rest of the period to improve and change your design. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. All right, so the, the main rules are the, are the first few bullets there. The last one talks about the written assignment that you're going to have to do. You're welcome to look ahead to that written assignment. That doesn't come until our competition day in here. But the reason you might want to look at it tonight is because part of that written assignment is just like what you're doing in tonight's homework. If you go here to the student work page, on my page, wow, we're really going slow, uh, and click on this second example, you will see this. This is a, a write-up from a project from years past. And you can see that not only did they have to draw a picture, but they had to describe it step by step, including all the simple machines, kind of like I did back there when I told you how it would run. They had to explain how some science was involved like Newton's third law. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And they show me how that takes place in somewhere in their simple machine. Or they talk about the momentum that a ball had because of its mass and velocity. And they include that in their description. So they have a couple science principles here. And then the last part is drawing the picture. This picture, you don't have to be a great artist, I'm not, and I drew the one on the sample you see there. Uh, this picture is just like a Rube Goldberg machine uh, cartoon or comic. I should be able to look at it and by just looking at it know how this machine works. And one of the requirements I've added since this student did hers is you have to number everything. 
there needs to be eight machines. So number eight would be right here at the end. That's the one that raises the flag. She's got a pulley there that raises the flag. And then number seven would be the next one back from that. And so she's labeled all of her machines so we know what kind of machine they are. Uh, and she's shown arrows so I can figure out just by looking at this, just like the cartoons, how this thing works. This is just like what you're going to be doing on your homework and in-class assignment here. Okay? All right. If you look further down on this same page, the next section I give you some tips. This is a good place to go back to if you get totally stuck. You're not particularly creative and you have no idea what to draw. It says, and this is the best tip I can give you that I learned from doing mine, begin with the end in mind. That means you start with, how am I going to raise the flag? Are you going to have a mousetrap with a lever lifted up from the ground? It's got to go up, but it's got to stay up eight inches. Are you going to have a pulley raise it up? If so, what's going to pull that pulley down so that the flag can go up? And you start with the end and you work your way backwards. I try to start from the beginning and then have it wind up raising the flag. Didn't work well. I wasted a lot of time. Start with raising the flag. You got that accomplished. That was the goal, right? Now you add in something to trigger that. And then something to trigger that something. And so on. And you work your way back from there. And I've given you some suggested steps right there in on this paper, okay? As far as materials, I don't want you to worry too much about materials just yet. We'll focus on that more tomorrow. I'll give you a supplies list tomorrow. I don't think I gave you that, did I? Okay. If you look on the back of this now, uh, there are more rules about the contest. In particular, I want you to notice number six on the back because those rules are often ones that students want to break. They want to do something flashy and impressive. In fact, I broke some of my own rules back there on my sample. It says, your machine can't have any water, sand, or other materials that require a great deal of cleanup and result in damage to the pegboard. So for instance, you couldn't you know, pop a water balloon. That's going to get water all over the place. It's going to ruin the pegboard. You can't even use duct tape to tape things to the pegboard or any kind of tape. You've got to find other ways to attach things. That's why I used wire ties, twist ties, you know, like you put on the top of bread, um, just plain old wire to tie things on. There's lots of other string. Those are things that I can take off easily. It says no combustible fluids. That means things you can light on fire. No open flame, no hazardous materials. You can't include a nuclear reactor in your Rube Goldberg machine. Not that you could build one anyway. You can't include party poppers or any kinds of explosives. Okay? Um, that would be considered dangerous. Next one, it says, motion of any sharp objects must be highly predictable and carefully controlled. Let me give you an example of what you can and can't do. You can make a lever like I did with a pin at the bottom that when the lever's hit, the pin swings and it pops a balloon. You can have a car roll down a decline plane with a pin taped to the hood. A little toy car pops a balloon. You can't have uh, a mouse trap with a razor blade attached to it that when you trigger it, the razor blade goes flying over. That's going to be dangerous. That's going to be out of control. You can't have you know, a crossbow shoot an arrow across the inside. That's a flying object that would be difficult to control where it winds up. In fact, no objects can, it says, I skipped one there, but it says no loose or flying objects can go outside of the boundaries. So there's your box, your frame. If a marble were to roll outside of the frame, you'd be disqualified. If any objects go above or outside that frame, you're disqualified. You have to keep everything contained inside that frame, that pegboard frame. If you want to use battery-powered stuff, that's fine, but you can't use anything that plugs into an outlet. Uh, you can't use profane, indecent, or lewd expressions, nor could you do things like uh, have Budweiser beer cans or any logos in your Rube Goldberg machines. If you're bringing in a soda bottle, take off the label. Okay? We're not sponsoring anybody with our, with our machines. 
That's one of the standard rules of the big contest, okay? Any questions on those rules? So when you draw out your plan here, and that's what we're gonna work on next, on paper, it's got to conform to all those rules. Let's switch now to this paper. What I want in your illustration is described in the bullets at the top, okay? And it says that you need to include your name, period, arrows, just like this one here has arrows showing me the motion, arrows. You need to label the start and the finish of your machine and number all machines. This person didn't do it, I didn't require it back then, but this would be, you know, machine number, number, well, if it would let me draw on it, number eight here, and then I just count back from there, okay? So you number all your machines. It needs to be done on unlined white paper, which I gave you there, and it needs to be with the paper turned this direction, not up and down sideways, okay? You're going to draw that illustration in a 3D box, just like the sample I gave you here. I'll help you with how to set up the 3D box here in a second. The last thing I'm gonna talk about here, though, is at the bottom. What is and is not counted as a machine? I wrote it on, on the board here for you as well. It says, every lever type counts as a different machine. So you could have a first class lever that triggers a second class lever, that'd be two different machines. You already have two of the four that are required. Uh, a funnel, a funnel can count as a wedge only if it spreads force over distance. That's the whole idea, it's a trade off of force for distance. So if you have a single ball fall into a funnel that then goes into something else, the funnel did nothing. You could just as easily replace it. Okay? If, however, like in my machine, I had rice go into the funnel and it allowed it to go through slowly, it spread that force over a longer distance, the outside of that funnel, then it's functioning as a wedge and it would count as one of your machines. Ask yourself this when you're trying to decide if it's a wedge. Just because something is a triangle shape doesn't make it a wedge. If I have a car that rolls down a decline plane and I'm keeping it from rolling by putting a triangle block underneath it, I could just as easily replace that with a square block. So the triangle doesn't do anything special for me there. It's just an object that I'm pulling out of the way. On the other hand, when I use pins to pop those balloons back there, that shape, you know, that pointy shape does something different than if the pin were shaped like that on the end. Because of its angle here, instead of all the force applied right here at one moment in time at, at a very short distance, now the force is applied over a longer distance. You see what the point does? That's why pointy objects pop things better than flat ones, because it spreads that force over a longer distance instead of something that was blunt. So a pin could be a wedge if it's working like that, if it's popping something. Gears, you can use gears. Gears are one of the hardest things to include in these machines. You can get gears from Lego sets and Connect sets if you've got them at home. If you're gonna use gears, the rules say you have to use two and they have to change either the direction or if you have a big one and a little one, they have to change the speed of the motion. Okay, so one gear is gonna be the input force, you're gonna drive that gear. The other gear is gonna be the output force and that's gonna send that motion on to something else farther down the road. That's for gears. Uh, two machines moving together count as one. So what I'm saying here is that if you've got two pulleys and the line goes over the top and you're lifting some weight here, okay? When I pull on the pulley, these two move together at the same time. Do you see that? That's a pulley set. They count as one machine. You can't count that as two. I had a setup back there where three pulleys all move together. That counts as one machine, not three, okay? If they move, you know, if this lifts a, a lever or something, and then that triggers an, another pulley over here, well, then I can count this as a separate one because there's a different kind of machine in between. Here's another common mistake people make is they think that, um, let's see if I have it here. 
they, they have, let's say, a decline plane. The ball rolls down the decline plane. And then they put another one here. So the ball does this. And they want to count those as two machines. Can't do it. That's all one decline plane. Okay. What you could do is you could have the ball roll down one decline plane. Then you could have it go up a short incline plane and then down another decline plane. One, two, three machines. Two of them are different. See how simple that was? Okay, so you just got to be a little creative. Two different machines. Remember, we were required to have four different machines. So this is one, two different machines, but one, two, three machines of the eight that are required overall. Okay, uh, the wheel and axle. If you're going to use a wheel and axle, it has to change force or distance. So what I mean is, like, here's, here's my wheel, here's my axle. I turn that wheel, it's going a great distance, but it requires very little force. Down here, this is going to move a short distance, but gives me a lot of force, okay? Like a screwdriver. That's exactly how a screwdriver would work. So what you would want to do if you're using a wheel and axle in your machine is, oh, I don't know, you could say take a string and wrap it around the wheel part, right? You pull that string, it doesn't require a lot of force, but it goes a long way. Over here, you could have another string or something wrapped around, and a little bit of, a lot of motion here gives you a little bit of motion here. Do you see how it's changed the distance that our motion is going? A lot of motion gives you a little motion here. A little bit of force here gives you a lot of force here. And in my machine, the little swing arm that pulled on the dominoes, that was just like this. Okay? I had one string wrapped around the axle. I had my, my thing like this, right, with the magnets on the end. And I had a string that was wrapped around the axle. And as this big wheel would turn, the axle would move a short distance, and this would barely move. It had a lot of force, enough to pull the domino over, but it would only move a short distance. This moved a big distance. Make sense? What a lot of people do in elementary school is they say, oh, I got a wheel and axle. They have a little car, a little toy car, rolling down the decline plane. No, sorry. It is true the toy car has a wheel and axle on it, but it could just as easily be a ball and do the same job. For it to function as a wheel and axle, I want to see you change force or distance. And that's what I've done here and what I've done here. Okay? All right. You now should know all the rules and know what I'm expecting you to do. Take your white piece of paper, turn it sideways. Step number one, I'm going to give you rulers. You're going to set up your 3D box. If you have no clue how to do that, wait and I'll explain. but I can do this. It just takes uh, perseverance, persistence. So if this is your page, <coughs> excuse me, again, you turn it sideways like this. <coughs> you want to start by drawing your box not as big as the page, but something like maybe this. Okay? No, that's not very straight. I don't like that. I'm going to fix that. Okay, so you start with your box about that big. That represents the back part of that pegboard. The reason I gave you pegboard, it has all the holes in it, so it's easy to wire and tie things onto the board. Then, you're going to go out diagonally in these corners like so. And then you're going to match that same angle like this, out to here.
And then you do a last line here along the bottom. So this piece here represents the floor of the frame. And this is where you're going to do most of your attachment. Some of it's going to be to the side walls, <coughs> some to the back wall, probably a lot to the back wall. So it'll look something like that. Now mine's a little uneven. I moved it too far this way, but you get the idea. <coughs> so you set up that 3D box first. And then the next thing I would do is figure out what's the last step. The last step is to raise a flag. Okay? One of the easiest ways to raise a flag is with um, a pulley. So I'm going to decide just off the top of my head that I'm going to put a pulley right here on that pegboard. And I'm going to have my line going over the pulley and my flag here attached to that pulley. Right? I know that this is my last step, so I'm going to number it eight. I'm also going to label it finish. Okay? And I'm going to indicate with arrows which way things are moving. So I've now decided in order to raise that flag, this line, this pulley line, has to be pulled down. Yes? It has to be elevated, eight inches, and it has to stay there. If I say eight inches, it could be, if you're measuring from here, that has to be increased by eight, by eight inches. If you're measuring from here, it has to increase by eight inches. So one point on the flag has to increase by eight inches or more and stay there. Okay? Now, I ask you to use pencil because you'll write this stuff down, then you'll go, hmm, I think I want to change that. Let's say, for instance, that you decide that a better way to pull that line would be to use a mouse trap. So over here, you got yourself a little mousetrap deal, and it's got its lever. And that lever arm is going to be attached to the string. So when you trigger the mousetrap, this lever arm goes this way. And when it goes that way, <coughs> it's going to pull on the string, raising the flag. So now I've got my mousetrap here. I have to figure out how I'm going to trigger, how I'm going to hit the cheese on the mousetrap, how I'm going to trigger it. Maybe I'm going to have a decline plane, like a tube, and I'm going to have a ball in it, and that ball is going to roll down the decline plane, striking the mousetrap, which then triggers it to raise the flag. There's number eight, here's number seven, and here's number six. It's that simple, guys. Okay. But be creative. Make sure you conform to the rules that I've given you and you identify each machine by number. If I can't tell what something is, like I don't know what that is, label it, right? Mousetrap. Because in Rube Goldberg's cartoons, we were supposed to be able to look at it and not have to ask questions, be able to just figure out how the thing works by just looking at it. So label anything that we're not clear about. <coughs> Don't forget to put your name, and period, on your paper, okay? And it also says um, the start and finish. I got the finish there. And make sure that you have eight machines total. There could be duplicates. You can have more than one decline plane, for instance. But four of them <coughs> must be different. Yes? Can I put pencil? No. I will tell you, you'll probably do multiple drafts with this. You'll go back and, oh, I don't like that, and change it. Try to really design something that you fully intend to build, not just some goofy thing.
I'm going to give you a little more inspiration here. You can go and get this right off of my web page, but if you go to the Rube Goldberg machine section, and you scroll down, you can see the one I showed you back there. But you can also see the winners from last year, and by the way, from previous years. It might give you some inspiration of what you could draw. Not only do they have to label their machines and the real thing that they build, they have little labels stuck to the board, but they have to explain how it works. <coughs> okay, so you drop the normal down the deep line plane, it falls into this cup, and after this, the first class level, the first class level pulls the string, which causes the car to push the model into that hole. It goes down this deep line plane into the cup, which triggers the first class lever. First class lever pulls this first class lever up after it goes through that hole and hits the third class lever in the mass channel, which pulls this weight down from the block and causes the string to go through the floor and raises the flat. why he has this wood block right there? Yeah, because if it did go out, he'd be disqualified. And some of these people that were showing their winning design were disqualified because they didn't follow that rule. Look for it. You'll see what I mean. Alright, so we put the marbles in the wedge and that makes the cup fall down. It has a little pin on it. And it pops the balloon. The rock falls off. The pin comes out of the decline plane. And a marble rolls down and backs over all the dominoes. And uh, hits the mouse trap, which gets the cup more slack, and it hits the wedge and starts the motor, which pulls it back. <coughs> so that one would have been disqualified. Why? All those marbles ran out the corner. Some people are real sly about covering up that uh, mistake. Here's our winner for the year. We turn the wheel and axle, which pulls the string through the pulley system. And the weight falls off the first class lever and it dips. And this weight will fall off pulling the pin out of the PVC pipe, which is acting as a decline plane, and the marble will roll down, drop it into the cup, which sets the first class lever off, which pulls this string, which is connected to the mouse trap for the third class lever, and that 
that pulls the string through fully and the plug goes out.